work pretty good. Uh, give me one second here. Turn that down just a little bit. All right, so please just let me know if you can see me and you can hear me okay, hear my voice, hear my guitar okay. And we will go from there. Just checking my settings one more time here. Looks like everything's good. All right, so I'll just wait and see your chat, make sure that this is working okay, okay? So I'll play a little bit, make sure you can hear me. <laughs> Joe, thank you. It says, sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Remember, if you're on Facebook, if you put your first name in there, I'll know who you are because Facebook blocks your, your name. So I'm looking over here at the chat here. So if you're on the Facebook group and you, you're texting me on or chatting or putting a comment in, make sure you put your name there. Hey, George is here. Ridiculizer is here. Loud and clear. Awesome. Patrick is here. Great. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, looks like you all can hear me okay. This is great. And uh, what we're going to be doing today, obviously, again, we're here to celebrate the release of Creative Blues Soloing, a guitar course that I have talking about blues soloing. Hello from Croatia. Hello from Ohio. Josh is here. Howdy, Steve. Audio sounds great this morning. Thank you, Josh. Ron is here. It says everything. Uh, Michael is here. Hello from Birmingham. Uh, or maybe you say Birmingham. Uh, a Volker here. All right, cool. Gavo, perfect, thank you. So what we're gonna do today is we're having a Q&A. That's what we're doing today. To celebrate uh, Creative Blue Soling, we've got a, um, we're just gonna be doing a Q&A, but we wanna keep the Q&A relative to blues, okay? So let's try not to get way off, way too far off in the weeds, otherwise it just becomes chaos. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and keep all the questions relative to blues. And I have a bunch of questions right here that I'm gonna to get to first, and then I'm gonna try and get to more questions uh, off of the chat as well. So again, just a Q&A today, hanging out a little bit, talking about blues, see what I can do to help you a little bit with that. Jeff from Panama City is here, uh, Ron is here, uh, Anton from the Ukraine is here, this is awesome. Kent Lundstrom, hi Kent. So looks like we're doing good here. Indonesia, Christopher is here. Uh, Greg from Chattanooga. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. So let's go ahead and get started, okay? Uh, hello, sir. Love from India. Yes, love from cold North Dakota. Actually, it's not too cold today. We're actually doing quite well this year. I think with 2020 the way it was, uh, we actually were blessed with having some halfway decent weather. So Brian, uh, Bryson says, Steve, you're amazing. No, you're amazing. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's look at what we've got here. Again, we're going to have a Q&A today. We're going to be talking about all things blues related. So let's not worry about other styles of music and things like that for this session. We can go live another time and talk about whatever. Hey, Kong. Uh, hey, Bob. Hey, Tony. Tony Lee. Liverpool calling. Awesome. This is great. All right. So our first question here says, Rabbit Will says, adding a coil split to my HH guitar, will it give her, give a better blues tone? Well, ironic that you said that because what I thought I would do today is instead of using one of my Ibanez's that usually have a humbucker, a single coil and a humbucker, I decided today I would use my Paul Reed Smith that has the stock uh, pickups in it. So this is a custom uh, custom 2410 top and this has the stock pickups in it. So I'm gonna use the same tone I was using before, the last sessions I was doing, but I wanted to show you a little bit about how this sounds. So you're gonna see this doesn't have a single coil. So when I'm on my, my usual tone that I really like to use, and right now I'm on the, uh, the bridge position pickup, okay? Hey, Bob. It's Bob from England. Hey, David. Hey, Anna. Hey, Barry. Hey, Paul. Uh, hey, Everton. So what you're going to notice right away is right now I'm on that bridge position pickup, and it's not near as hot as it was on my Ibanez. So the, the style of guitar that you're using, the pickups that you've got in there, these are passives. The, uh, the All the Ibanez stuff that I have, most guitars that I have have EMGs in them. Those are active pickups. So right away, things are a little bit different here. So if I switch to the center position here, now I've had this customized to where I only have a three position switch, which is what I like to have. So when it's, it's like usual, when it's here, this is on, when it's here, it's split to these two, and when it's here, this is on. And that's, that, that's not how these usually come, but that's what I've got it set up for. Uh, hey, Kevin, you're welcome very much. 
Okay, Pat, we're going to get to the blue note. We'll talk about that for sure. Okay, so if I go to the center position now, so I'm splitting both both uh, pickups. Now, it sounds different than my Ibanez did, and for me, it doesn't have quite the same sound on this preset that I've been using before in some of the other live sessions. If I go to the neck position, see, it's a little bit beefy. So with this particular guitar and that tone that I normally like to use, what I would do is I would go to my bridge position and I would just roll off my volume. You see that? So if I bring it all the way up, it's a little bit more aggressive. If I bring it back a little bit, see? Now this tone is a tone that I've modified, but if you look it up, if you use a Kemper, you can go on the, the public, whatever they call it, the preset exchange, I think it's called. It's a Dr. Z uh, preset that I've that I got off of there, and then I just kind of add my own reverb and delay. But you're right, it does have a bit of a bigger reverb on it. It just makes for a really nice, sweet kind of blues tone. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. Will the uh, coil split give your HH a better blues tone? It gives you more options. I can't say for sure that it would give you a better blues tone, but it is nice to have to get that option of being able to split it and, and go from there. So uh, somebody had asked the blue note. So the blues note is when you're playing, for instance, if you're playing minor pentatonic, if you go to the third note of the minor pentatonic, between the third and fourth notes of the minor pentatonic, right in between there is what we call the flatted five, okay? The diminished five, the flat five. That note is the blues note. And in this case, we're looking at the note E flat. So that is the blues note. And again, it's a great note. It's not a great note to, to land on and emphasize, but it's a great note to touch on. So when you're playing, you could slide to it, hammer to it, pull to it, whatever, pick it, but move on. You see that? Okay. So that's what a blue note is. Let's see, shuffle versus swing. Shuffle versus swing, it, it has more to do with the, the groove of the drummer than it does just the overall. They're both going to have a triplet feel, right, where a straight rhythm is going to be one and two and three. A shuffle and a swing, both are going to have a triplet feel, but it has more to do with the drum beat than anything, okay? Um, but from a guitar player's perspective, when you're jamming, for me, it, they're, they're pretty much the same thing. It's being what's emphasized on in terms of the drums uh, or percussion, I should say. Okay. Neck position is best, I think, for melodic or blues. And that's the thing. See, for me, when I'm playing lower on the fretboard, I tend to be more bridge oriented. And when I get up here, that's when I tend to go to my neck position. You see up there, I it gets too bitey in my bridge position for me. It's not that I don't use it sometimes, but it's just kind of a, a, a built-in thing. When you watch me play, you'll see as I move up, I have a tendency of always heading over to the, the neck position. And when I'm lower down, I tend to use more of the bridge position to kind of balance out that tone. But again, everybody's different. Okay, let's see here. Gavin says, please do a list of intermediate level guitar solos to learn. Goodness, I, I honestly, Gavin, I couldn't even say because what does intermediate mean? I mean, it means different things to different people. What I would say is if you're going to learn some solos, try and go with solos that um, if you're looking for something easier, now I'm not saying easy or intermediate or whatever, I'm just saying something that's not insane. The easiest way to pick the right ones is ones that you can sing in your head. You don't have to sing it out loud, but sing it in your head when you know maybe you can hum along with it or something like that or at least in in your mind you can because if they get really fast to where it's a blur in your brain it's already going to be more work on your guitar now if you're at that stage at that level that's great but if you're looking for something um you know easy you want something that's nice and you know you want something that you can sing 
If you want a bump up from that, then you try and look for maybe something that has more movement, but it's still within the context of a speed that you think that you can handle, right? Or a longer solo. Maybe it's still really easy, but it's just a lot longer. You know, if you think of something like, um, you know, I was told, I used to tell students that if you listen to like Freebird or something like that by Leonard Skinner, it pretty much has every kind of classic lick that you could ever want to learn um, <laughs> right there in, you know, a six minute solo. But it takes a long time to memorize something like that, where you might just, you know, grab a few things that you really like out of there. That's the most important thing is, is finding an artist that you like. Like I used to use a Randy Rhodes and Joe Satriani and Angus Young and Jimmy Page, like those were there's, those were Ace Freely from Kiss. Those were the guys that I would go to and try and learn licks. You know, I, I would hear something and then I would try and repeat. You know, I, I would play those sorts of things. Um, again, whether that means beginner or intermediate, I don't know what that means, but I could hear them and I'd heard it so many times that it was embedded in my brain, so it was easier for me to play. Okay. Um, Shane says, Shane Marcos says, what, at, what can you advise for people who kind of rely on distortion for soloing, who try to solo on blues music, which wants clean channel solos? Sometimes it just doesn't fit. Well, again, it's, it's a personal taste. Um, you know, what I find a lot is that for some reason people you know, either overuse distortion or are just terrified to use distortion entirely. You know, if I go to a, a cleaner, kind of sound like that. It sounds great. For a part of the song. But if the, all of a sudden things start getting beefed up a little bit, I want more meat in that, that tone, right? That's where I'd want... Now, there's still some distortion on there, but there isn't much. But if I add in that delay and reverb a little bit in there, see, now all of a sudden it gives me that kind of kind of quintessential sort of Gary Moore guitar tone for blues rock, which is what I love. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's nothing I could advise people on. Just the one thing I would say is, is your guitar tone, not just distortion, but your tone in general, should match the the situation you find yourself in what the band is doing right because i always think like i've played live on stage a million times and and you know you might be in the middle of a song and all of a sudden your band like your drummer and everybody drops everything and it's really quiet at that point what are you going to do like are you are you still soloing on 10 right or are you going to bring it back a little bit like a lot of times music when you're jamming when you're really playing with somebody not just necessarily a jam track or something, but when you're really playing, there's an ebb and flow that happens with that music sometimes. Sometimes you get a song that's just right, you know, if I'm playing, um, again, it doesn't really want a clean distortion, right? Or a clean tone, no distortion. But I don't need to be over the top with my gain. Like I, I find a lot of younger players or a lot of new players, I should say, not younger, but newer players, have a tendency of, of using way too much distortion. And the problem is, is when you use way too much in these sorts of situations, you don't really get the tone of everything else that's happening. You just get a lot of distortion. Now, if you're playing something like, you know, God knows what, anything heavier, of course you want a lot of distortion. But what I've learned along the way is you always can use a little less than you think you could. And a lot of times the less distortion, if you can get away with this instead of this, right? If you could get away with this and still be comfortable, your tone is going to be better. So, okay, let's see here. Emerson says, could you please teach us one basic blues lick, one intermediate and an and other advanced? Well, how about if I play a couple of licks for you? Because I don't want to take way too long with this and then you can rewatch this. Now, some basic blues licks would be some of the licks that I showed you in the last session. You know, something where you're just maybe doing a Chuck Berry kind of thing. <laughs> Okay. An intermediate lick might be something like where I'm doing like some hammer on some pull offs. So I'm playing seven, eight, seven, five. And then I'm playing here, eight, five. And then eight, seven, five. And then going to my root there, right there. And you can make it as fast as you want. Or you can, you know, turn around, do something like that. More of an advanced blues lick 
you know, things like maybe where you start stretching out a bit more. Right there, what I'm doing is I'm playing nine to five, eight, nine. Okay. And then maybe I'll drop down, let's go to the six. Then down to the root. So it's becoming a bit more like a sweep maybe, right? And then I'm just going to tag it with the turnaround, that, that uh, minor to major twist we talked about. Yeah, anything like that. Just something like that might be kind of fun for you to try. You know, it still has a blues flavor, kind of a Paul Gilbertish kind of thing. Oh, uh, let's see here. Uh, Amy says, how can I get this tone? Well, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but one of the things that you do, a tone is so strange because it has to do with, you know, your amp and of course, you know, your fingers and the way that you pick the intensity, the dynamics that you use, you know, the way that you set the volume, all these things make a difference. But certainly, you know, the guitar that you're using, the pickups that you're using, the amp that you're using all has a very big impact on your tone. What I always tell people again is whatever amp that you're using, start with just putting everything at 12 o'clock or zero, whatever you want to think of it as, right? Except your volume, obviously. Put that wherever it needs to be. And then just start tweaking a little bit, right? Immediately start trying to just dial in a little bit of your low and your mid and your high. Usually for me, my low stays here. If anything, my low tends to, uh, I back my low end off a little bit because again, most of the time, whether I'm recording, whether I'm playing live, whatever, that big beefy, beefy, excuse me, uh, low end doesn't really do me any good. Okay. So it, it, everything tightens up if I drop off the low end a little bit, but it depends. If I'm using a Mesa Boogie, I'm going to have to drop it off more where if I'm using a JCM 800 by Marshall, I can turn that low end up and I'm not really still going to get a lot of beef out of it because they just don't have a lot. So it depends on the amp that you're using. The mid range for me is the sweet spot. The mid range when you're live the mid range is what cuts through the mix. When you're recording or something, it might be a little bit different, but when you're, when you're live, it's always nice to have a bit more mid range to cut through that mix. If you turn it up way too much, sometimes it becomes too honky, like a duck, you know, quack, you don't want that kind of sound. So you have to back it off a little bit, but the mid range is something that I would definitely boost. And then high end or treble is something that, again, I just kind of boost to taste. If I'm playing in a heavier band, I tend to turn that up a little bit more. If I'm playing like bluesy stuff like this, I tend to back it off a little bit. But again, I can control that. If I go to my neck position, it's going to roll some of that off anyway. Or if I use my tone control, I can roll some of that off. So there's lots of different ways that you can approach tone, okay? It just takes time. Uh, Palav says, what is the devil's note and how to use it properly? Well, that's the blues note that we were talking about. So again, like we talked about, I talked about earlier, use hammer-ons, pull off slides, things like that. The trick is, is don't spend a lot of time on it. Over your root, it's going to sound horrible, right? But if you go to it, it creates this dissonance. But when you resolve it, all of a sudden it sounds good again. So the, the, the blue note is the devil's note or devil's triad or devil's interval or whatever you want to call it. Okay. Let's go back here a little bit here and see where we're at. Um, I'm also trying, this is Jamie. Jamie says, I'm also trying to improve my improv with some licks, but more pop based stuff. Well, uh, again, pop rock, you, the biggest thing that you can do is uh, I, I can't even define a pop blues lick. Um, it's making it fit within the context of the music. Cause everybody remember this. I remember a, there was a quote by Joe Satriani a long time ago about soloing. And he was saying that practice, practicing soloing without a chord progression underneath you, without a rhythm underneath you is really kind of pointless, not completely pointless, but where your true musical skills lie is in your availability of being able to create music over the top of something right? Whether it's a band, whether it's a jam track, whether it's something you've written, whatever, but something where you're interacting with music, not just playing, but interacting, right? So if I do this and you can, you can let me know if, if you can kind of hear this. Now, this is just a minor blues and a, it's the first thing that popped up on YouTube. I literally typed in a minor blues, and this is the video that popped up. Okay. So if I start this and I don't know if it'll be too loud, you might have to tell me. Okay. 
Now, if you can hear that, okay, it's giving me a groove and it's giving me chords. Now, it's going to be a 12-bar blues for the most part in A minor, but it's giving me a groove. So when I start playing, I have to think about, again, making connection to the chords, playing some licks, making melodic inferences, right? Um, traveling around my guitar, trying to do something interesting. Here's my A. Now I know E is coming, so I might make my way down. So I'm trying to respond to the music that I'm listening to. That's the whole thing. Whether you call that blues or pop or whatever, that's, that's the whole thing that's happening. So for me, it's not really a genre thing, although obviously genres exist, right? But whether it's pop blues or rock blues or blues blues, or it's, it's just all of those things. So, you know, if you were doing something that's more ballad based, but it has, because blues is defined by the groove right? The chord progression that you're using, the feel that you're using, the, all of those things go in there. And certainly as blues players, we want to add those things that sound bluesy, like the, the blue note. If we just play a pentatonic scale, the pentatonic isn't really telling us that it's bluesy. Although that phrasing could kind of be bluesy, right? But when I start adding in that blues note, use some of that kind of phrasing, right? Then all of a sudden it starts taking shape of blues, but it depends on what I'm playing over, right? So if I'm playing over and I start going, it may work and it may not work, right? Because the song is telling you, hey, I'm more of a pop sort of song. And then the solo comes up, you know, you might want to do something that's a little more you know, I always think like Slash is a really great guy to look at for that because Slash will move between pop, rock, whatever you want to call that, and then blues constantly, you know? So when he's doing something where he's... He's doing more of just singing with the, the guitar, right? Um, all those kind of things that he'll do... Um, and then all of a sudden he'll go into his bluesy thing where he's soloing and he'll start doing all that kind of stuff. So it's very easy to kind of move around between those two worlds. Okay. Let's see here. What are some cool ideas for playing over the turnover or turnaround, excuse me, when you get to the five and the four chord and back to the one? Well, there's lots of things. I like to do a lot of chromatics when I'm on the five. Where I'll do things like that. The big one is when you're on the one going back to the five at the end where you can do like the, the walk-ups. You know, all those kind of things depending on what key you're in. You know, there's lots of things like that that you can do as well. So chromatics are always nice and you'll see all of those things that I'm doing contain chromatics. Okay? All right, let's get back to a few more questions here. What's your recommendation for, oh, who is this? This is the dude Z4. What's your recommend, uh, recommendation for impromptu licks and solos? I find myself doing the same pattern over and over and over. Well, the trick is, is some of those patterns you're going to want to keep, right? I mean, if, if, they're, if they're worthwhile and you've been playing them and they're comfortable, you want to keep some of those things. But the trick is you got to get out of that same position. And that's one of the most important things is that licks will not save you. Just learning licks will not save you, okay? If you really want to get good at this stuff, and I'm being completely honest with you, learning more about the fretboard and how the positions connect together in whatever key you're playing in or want to play in or whatever that is, that's where the real magic is. And then creating licks out of that visualization of your fretboard. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't want to learn licks, right? I learn licks all the time. But I don't have 486 licks in my brain at my disposal. It doesn't work that way. Usually, you know, if, I, if I'm just looking for a cool new lick, I'll just go wherever and try and find a new lick. And then I'll try and take that lick and I'll practice it over and over and over and over and over and over and embed it into my playing. Not just learn the lick. 
because learn, just learning a lick means by next week, I'm probably going to forget what I even learned, right? I've got to embed it into my playing. It's got to become part of my, my being. So I not only practice the lick, but then I jam with it and I use my normal stuff and I, I embed that lick into what it is I'm doing. So that's my whole thing with, with getting out of that kind of boring way of playing. You got to stop just playing up and down. You know, you start looking for more interesting ways to play, even just playing pentatonic, but learning how, like what I was doing right there, learning how to palm you. Right, different kinds of things like that. Learn, learning how to use hammer-ons and pull-offs. But using all these things we've talked about through all of these live sessions, you know, dynamics and things like that, sliding, hammer-ons, pull-offs, bends, vibrato, all of these things. And then when you come to somewhere in your song or on your fretboard or whatever it is, and you want a cool lick, right, then you, you, you either create something or maybe you've learned a particular lick. That's the other thing, too, that I used to do wrong when I was a kid. So I would learn ideas. I would learn licks and different things like that. But when it came time to actually play, I could never apply any of it because I didn't learn it good enough. I didn't learn how the lick functioned. I didn't really learn what key, what position on the fretboard, what chord in that key it was being played over, right? If it's, if it's a really powerful lick that's being played over the four chord, and you just learned the lick and you're trying to do it over the one chord, it might not have the same impact had you placed it strate strategically over the four chord like the artist originally did, you see? So you have to sometimes think a little bit deeper, deeper about those. And I know that answers a few questions that I see here, okay? Um, Rex says, I still don't know much about pedals. What does a reverb and delay do, okay? Reverb, just think about reverb as being, um, if you're in a big room and you talk and you hear it go, it's really kind of large right? The, the sound travels. A delay comes back to you, right? So a delay, like you can probably hear those delays. I have a stereo delay bouncing back and forth, right? Where reverb is kind of a wash over the whole thing. You can kind of hear it go over the top. Okay. So having a little bit of those two things just makes it sound a little more alive, right? Where when I turn it off, you know, if I'm looking for that kind of sound, that's great, okay? But if I went to my solo, I'd probably turn it on again. My whole thing with reverb and delay or anything like that is it just, it shouldn't intrude on your regular guitar signal. It shouldn't, like my stuff is never as loud as my signal. So if my guitar signal is here, my delay and my reverb are here. So as I play, they're not getting in the way. They're not washing over my stuff. I don't want my signal here and my delay and reverb are louder than that, or even at the same volume, unless it's an effect that I'm using for a particular reason. It's always going to be down here. So that way, as I'm playing, you don't really hear it. When I'm done playing, that's when you hear it. It adds space in there. And that's one thing that I've always loved about delay and reverb is sometimes what it does is it acts like um, a musical element on its own. So when you play... You can stop playing for a minute and it's filling that space. You don't always have to feel like you have to play the entire time. And it makes that last note, the tail of that last note that you play, it gives it a real musical shine. Where if I don't have that on there and I go, it's just getting sucked into a vortex. There's nothing there. It's just dead. You see? So to have a little bit of something, is nice. Now, maybe you don't want that much or whatever. Again, I'm not tailoring a guitar tone just for this live session. This is just a general guitar tone that I use for all kinds of different things, but it's definitely in the bluesier vein than some of my heavier stuff. Okay, let's see here. Uh, George says, chord chasing. Any reason not to use the third or fourth position of D minor pentatonic over the D chord? You can play any position that you want at any time, George. Let me say this, though. Don't overthink everything. Be careful with that. Don't overthink. Don't overthink everything. Okay. So you, for me, I don't sit and think about positions when I play. It's just, where do I want to go? I'm thinking more about voicing. Like when I'm down here, I'm, I'm starting a conversation, right? That's where I'm starting a conversation. If I'm up here, I'm not starting a conversation. I'm already screaming at you. Okay. So for me, it's not so much like a first position, second position kind of thing. 
you know, you can, like what we talked about before with combining major and minor pentatonic, you can do that over the entire fretboard anywhere you want. The problem is, is with some people, they go, okay, so I need to study my major and minor pentatonic over the entire fretboard for the next three years before I ever try and make any music. No, just figure out how to do it a little bit and then, you know, fall on the other stuff that you've been practicing. And if you want to expand it out a little bit and learn a little bit more, that's an awesome thing. But don't be careful with all or nothings in the world anyway, okay? If we're just always thinking about things as all or nothing, it, it, we wind up missing out on so many other little things. So for me, that's the whole thing is, is I'm not thinking position. I'm really not. My fretboard is my fretboard. So if I'm in whatever key, you know, if I'm in G, I can decide. to come up here because it's, again, it's, it's it's a little speaky, but it's a little singy, right? Where if I come down here, it's very speaking. I'm speaking to you. But if I come up here, now I'm, I'm really yelling at you, right? You see? So I always think about that. The thicker strings are obviously lower in pitch, and so they're a little bit more speaking or singing, mellow. The thinner strings tend to get a bit more singing to screaming depending on where you are. So that's what's nice about a position on the guitar, no matter where you are, is that you've got these lower notes where you can create some nice low stuff, and then you got this mid-center, and you got higher. So you can you can choose those those kind of sections, if you will, to decide how you want your solo to sound. Not just I'm playing it because that's what I know and I just have to play all the notes because I don't want one of the notes to feel bad, right? Or something like that. So that's how I think about it. And obviously they they kind of overlap, right? So when I come up here, I'm 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 maybe even up here. I now I'm screaming at you, right? But when I get down in this area. I'm not screaming anymore. But down here, it begins to sound a little bit like your, your notes sound a little bit different than they do. Here. Or here. You see, they, they sound different. See how these sound really kind of fuzzy and... Now, I'm not saying bad, I'm just saying they sound different. Where this is a bit, there's more clarity in some of these notes, even though the octave is the same. So that's what I think about more than positions, okay? Hello again from Denmark. It's snowing, uh, Margaret says. Yeah, we're supposed to get a blizzard here tomorrow. So uh, let's see here. Can you advise people? To... Oh, I already did that one. I'm, I must be quite a ways back here. Let me keep going and see if I can find. And I apologize. I'm not going to get to get everybody's questions. That's that's going to be pretty tough, but um, I'll do the best I can here. What are some cool ideas? Oh, we already did that one. New Spark owner here. Where do I find the Spark presets? You have to load the software on uh, your Android or your iPhone or whatever it is that you've got. And then there's a cloud, there's a little, a little button on there that you'll see whether you're, I, I'm an iPhone person, so on my iPad or my iPhone, it's the same thing. There's a little cloud in the upper right-hand side. I, I think that's where it is. I think it, I'm pretty sure it is. And you click on that. You got to log into your account and that sort of thing because you have to have an account with them. So when you log in, then you can look for all kinds of tones for your Spark pre or uh, all kinds of different presets, excuse me. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, let's see here. Sorry, I'm just kind of reading through these to see. Okay, so somebody mentioned the Tone Cloud. Thank you for, for uh, doing that. <laughs> was I born with a guitar? No, I started playing when I was 13, but I, I knew what I wanted to do when I was about 10 years old. I wanted to be a football player, and then when I wound up being five foot two, uh, football playing and uh, basketball were kind of out of the, out of the uh, picture. And guitar was certainly the next thing that I wanted to do. Okay. My problem is I have really short fingers. I'm telling you right now, Adelaine, I have really short fingers. And if you and I met, I, you'd be hard pressed to have smaller fingers than I do. I'm telling you. People are always shocked by that. You just got to stretch. You just got to get used to it. You just got to practice. And think about where your wrist placement is. It's not just the stretching, although that does make a difference. But it's your wrist placement. 
And it's your guitar placement. You know, if you've got your guitar sitting like this, it's harder to play. Or if you're playing standing up and your guitar is way down here, it's going to be harder to reach some of that stuff. So you might need to bring that up a little bit to be able to reach some of that stuff. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you that our, my, our, at least our hands would be the same size. So if I can do it, you can do it. Okay. All right. Doug is here. Tom is here. Uh, uh, let's see here. How about two string licks where you'll, where you only bend one while playing both. Okay. You can't figure it out. So this is Kevin Brooks's question. So Kevin, um, let's just say I'm going to come up here to the 15th fret of the second string with my third finger, and I'm going to put my other two fingers behind it like we talked about with bending. I'm going to bend that up a whole step. Okay, so that's my bend. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my pinky and I'm going to place it on the 15th fret of the first string. So the, the pinky doesn't move. You just press in with the pinky, press into the fretboard, and then you do your traditional bend and kind of act like your pinky doesn't even exist. Now I could play them both at the same time. Okay. Or I might bend this one and bring this one up. But the goal is, is define your bend first, like really get used to being comfortable with the actual bend and then start adding on the note. Like really get to where you, you've got that bend locked in. And then your pinky is then available. For all that sort of thing. Okay, let's keep going here. Uh, accidentally happy. Do you have some tips for raking techniques? Well, raking, we talked about this in one of the earlier sessions. Um, so raking... <laughs> Raking, what you're doing is you're deadening out strings until you get to your directive note, the note that you want to, your target note, if you will. So if you're raking this direction, you're going to deaden out probably with your first finger more than likely. Oh, Amy didn't write that? Oh, I'll have to figure out who wrote that. Oh, sorry. I, I'm on something else. So I'm on accidentally happy right now. But... Okay. So I'm doing this rake upward and I'm landing on that seventh fret. So I'm deadening out the notes with this. If I was going the other direction, I might deaden out with my first finger still by kind of laying it over there. And then coming in like that, okay? So as far as turnarounds go, there's a lot of different things that you can do with turnarounds. Again, turnarounds can happen. You might be doing stuff where you go. And I think I've got a guitar course just on turnarounds, don't I? Derek, if you're out there, I think I do, but. Okay, so again, in more of a traditional sense, um, you know, it depends on the song. You can put in turnarounds and turnarounds are really great things that kind of just tie things up. And the great thing about turnarounds is it tends to kind of help everybody know that we're coming to the end of something. So if I'm here on A, I'm coming off my five to my A. But then I got to, you know, I might throw something in over the top of that E, something like that. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's keep going here. What's the Hendrix chord don't ask says? What's the Hendrix chord? The Hendrix chord is a dominant seventh chord with a sharp nine. So the Hendrix chord, for instance, if I played it at the, I'm going to go to the seventh fret of the fifth string, I'm going to play seven, six, seven, and then nine. Sorry, eight, seven, six, seven, eight. So that's what the Hendrix chord is. Okay, so that's what I'm doing is I'm playing this, this dominant seventh chord here, seven, six, seven, and then I'm adding in that eight on the second string with my pinky. That's what it is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Let's see here. Um, okay, we got that. Amy, how to record guitar without latency? Well, you have to have an audio interface and you got to set your audio interface so uh, 
the latency is really low. Okay. So for instance, I don't have it up here, but um, I'm using a Personas audio interface back there. Oh, you can't see it, but it's back there. There it is. Okay. So you need an audio interface that has low latency. And then when you connect it to your uh, DAW or your digital audio workstation, you try and set the latency as low as you can. Okay. So let me see if I can pull this up here. Um, so like right here, I'm using the Steinberg one. I have two different audio interfaces that I use. They're both sitting back there. So this one, I've got the buffer size set for 64 samples. Okay. So my audio late or my input latency is only four milliseconds and my output latency is only five milliseconds, but I have to set that at the 64 buffer size. If I set it really high, then I'm going to get a lot of latency. Okay. So it, it all has to do with your audio interface. Okay. Christian says, thanks for your dedication. I appreciate that. I appreciate you being here. Okay. Um, let's see here. Beaker says, how can we play solos over a drum track? How to combine chords and play. You just, again, if you go out on YouTube and type in 12 bar blues drums or something like that, you could just practice playing over that. Okay. Um, loving your Sparks presets. Thank you. Any chance of the same for a bias desktop software? I think I do have some uh, presets out there for bias. I don't know if it's bias effects or bias amp that I've got presets for, but I know I have some out there. Okay, let's see here. Glenn, how do I connect in moving position between position in a smooth way when I'm soloing blues? Connection points. Glenn, what I do, um, oftentimes what I do is I use sliding, right? So like right there, I'm sliding from my first position to my second position of A minor pentatonic. And then when I'm on that, I'm on a nine right now, right? With my third finger. This is a, a thing we talked about before too. If you haven't watched all these videos called, um, um, what did I call them again? Escape routes, escape routes or escape routes, however you say it. So when I'm on this nine, I can then switch over to my seven and now I'm in a new position, you see? Or I could do this, watch this, I could go. And then I'm gonna go to that seven, but I'm gonna slide up. And now I'm in a new position again. And that's kind of how you get around is learning when you, if you haven't seen the other video, I definitely watch it, but that way you get used to when you, when you want to shift somewhere, you have to think about what finger you're on and what string you're on and what you want to do. Then what's your next action. You know, if you're on your third finger, you're, you're probably going to have to travel toward the floor or toward the ceiling in some capacity, right? So you have to think about, like I might come down that way. But then when I'm on my pinky here, I might slide up, but now I'm on that pinky, so where can I go? Well, logically, I could come up this way. But again, we're back to that same thing. We're knowledge of your fretboard, fretboard connectivity. Okay. We even have a guitar course at Guitar Zoom called Ultimate Fretboard Connection. And that's exactly what it's about is learning to make these connections. Okay. Uh, Smiley says, loved your original solo over the recent Holy Diver cover. Thank you. Some of that was based off me doing my own thing relative to the first version. And some of it was uh, based off a Kill Switch Engage version of that song, which is pretty fun. Um, whoop. It's all going by really fast here. So does playing an, on an acoustic guitar make it a little bit harder for playing blues? Yeah. Playing acoustic guitar all the way around makes it a little bit harder because you got to work a little bit harder. Just like having thicker strings on your electric guitar makes it a little bit harder. Okay. Can you show us your finger calluses? You wouldn't be able to see them from here. And I really don't have calluses anymore. I just have deadened fingertips. They just, they're just very numb, but I don't, I don't, calluses went away years ago, so I don't really have that anymore. Okay. Let's see here. Just going to try and get to a few more here because I know there's so many, so many here. Um, Pat, Pat says, are we limited to only playing the notes in the key that we are in? If not, 
when can you go outside? You can totally go outside. Again, we talked about this before too, where you might play something in A minor. And you might throw in a chromatic thing, or you might do one of those old Jimmy Page things where you go. You know, that kind of thing. Or Randy Rose would do those a lot to shift positions. You know, something like that. But you can do all kinds of things like that. You might do a lick. Like Ace Frehley from Kiss would do that a lot, where he would shift into another key by just simply moving that up. So you can actually change keys by doing that, or you can just add in notes that, see the thing about guitar all the way around is that there really aren't wrong notes, there's just more right notes, right? There's right-er notes. So those notes are the ones that you wanna try and target. Like if you're on an A chord, and you try and ta target the, the dominant seventh sound, it's gonna sound bluesy. Or if I go to the major third, it's going to sound bluesy. If I go to the roots, it's just going to sound normal, right? I could go to the root and then go to the seventh. And and again, I'm 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 situating myself so over that A chord, you well, not necessarily you, but I'm connecting with the band, right? But from there. I can do all kinds of stuff that uses notes that aren't in there, but I've got to sell it. And by sell it, I don't mean financially. I've got to sell it musically, right? I've got to sell it so it sounds like music. So if I go. I got to try and make that sound. Let's see. Right? Then all of a sudden it begins to sound maybe a little more jazzy or something like that. But. It all depends. So some songs don't want you to step outside that. Like if you're playing a regular kind of straightforward pop song, you're probably not going to step outside the lines that much. Where in blues, again, it depends on the type. Certainly not so much if you were playing like, a, let's say you're doing a minor blues. You know, that doesn't really have a lot of room for it. But that doesn't mean that it might not fit. It doesn't mean that you might not make it fit amazingly. So it just kind of depends. Okay? I'm going to try and get caught up a little bit here with a couple other things that are over the last few minutes here. How do you, and this is Christopher, how do you pick the string when you want to play a really fast lick? How do you pick the string when you want to play a really fast lick? Well, you practice picking, right? <laughs> And then you synchronize that with whatever your lick is going to be, which is a whole other topic of conversation, right? But let's say you just wanted to tremolo pick, right? You were playing and you wanted to go, and you want to do something like that, where it's tremolo picking is just picking as fast as you can. So you just practice two things. You practice getting loose in your hand and your wrist, okay? And then you practice as little friction as you can on the string. And the third thing I would say is you practice trying not to leave that string as leave that string as little as possible. Okay, you don't need big wide stripes or swipes like this. Oh, I'm having a hard time talking today. Um, you don't need that. What you need is just tiny little. You know, you might do something like that. But if it's a picking thing, it's all about synchronization. You know, you got to just practice these things, um, which I haven't warmed up with this stuff yet either. But that's what you do is you just sit down. Like most of the time, what I do is when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is just roll through a bunch of different finger exercises to get my fingers limber for this kind of playing. Um, not that I use that a lot in my blues playing, but that's another, another thing entirely. Uh, let's see here. How do you sli splice up blues? How do you spice up blues chord progressions? Fernando asks. Uh, Fernando, uh, one thing that you can do is you can, I mean, we talked about this before too, where you can, you can make some variations of chords. I would watch one of the last videos, but one thing you can do is you can start using some chromaticism in your playing. Like, let's say you're going from your A and you want to go to your D. So we're going from A to D. I might use a... Some things like that. 
or just single ones. I might go. So you can use chromatics and things like that. And the other thing is, is that you've got, for instance, if you've got your pinky available, you can always add in some notes from your scale. And then you create little melodies. You see? So there's lots of things like that that you can do as well. Uh, let's see here. Andy says... Uh, Primal Janitor says, would you say your fingertips are comfortably numb? That's very good. Andy says, Steve, uh, very much enjoying your lessons and in awe of your skills. Thank you. I always gave trouble. F I always have trouble fitting in a turnaround. Yeah, and that's the thing is, is it depends on the, the, the rhythm, right? It depends on the rhythm. It depends on the tempo and things like that. We've talked about uh, some turnarounds earlier too, but it depends on what it is you're doing. Normally, we're going to be adding those turns or turnarounds from the one to the five at the very end, right? So if we're in A, you know, you again, you might want to add in a, you know, and I think we even have a guitar course that has just turnarounds. Again, I, I know I said this earlier, but Derek, maybe you could post something about that if we do still have that. Right? Just looking for different kinds of turnarounds that you like. I'm sure we do. I'm sure we've got a guitar course that's just all about that. Let's see here. How does one get into noodling? I can only play riffs. Well, you got to start learning how to play single notes, right? And learn your scale and things like that. Just start learning how to kind of move back and forth. What you should do is, um, you know, since you're already on YouTube, I can see, look up my name and look up the term meandering. Do that. Look up Steve Stein meandering, and that will help you to start learning how noodling kind of works in the, in the entry, entry level stage. Okay. Tony, uh, Tony T says, do I use the BB box a lot? Again, I don't really think about them that way, but if we were thinking about using, like if, if I'm an A and I, or I come up here, you know, it's that one to three position, five to seven, or the eight and 10, here's another one. You know, do I use those? For sure I use those. But I'm thinking more about the combinations of the notes, but for sure, absolutely. I would recommend you do the same thing, for sure. Uh, let's see here. To repeat someone else's question, any ways to play blues in a more original way? Well, again, it depends on what your definition of original is. Blues isn't original, right? So using blues elements in your own music, which people do all, all the time, you know, you take a look at like uh, black country community or whatever, you know, um, I mean, there's, you know, there's all kinds of stuff out there that's bluesy, but it's not blues. Uh, Monster Truck is a, is a hard rock band that uses bluesy elements in their playing all the time. You hear a lot of like stoner rock, even stoner metal that uses a lot of bluesy elements in their playing. Um, but it doesn't really sound like blues. I mean, it just depends on where you're going. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Okay. Is bluegrass considered blues? Boy, that's a really good question. I've never really thought about that. I'm sure there's, I mean, there's certainly blues elements in bluegrass. You know, it's country blues from a, you know, not country blues like, you know, pickup truck country blues, but country blues in terms of like faster speed playing, you know, that sort of thing. But yeah, I would say yes. Um, let's see here. Uh, huh, 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 huh. We'll go for just a couple more minutes here. We've got to be done in the next five minutes here. Dr. Smith says, do you use the Studio One software that comes with the Personas interface? I do. I mean, Personas makes the Studio One software. I have the professional version of it, but you don't need the professional version of it. You know, it comes with a, I don't know if it's Prime or Artist that comes with it. Prime uh, is perfectly fine. It's free. And then artist is a bump up from there. Artist is definitely usable if, if you have the artist version because artist, you're able to use plugins and things like that. Prime uh, has some limitations because it is free. So if you have the artist version, artist is perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, let's see here. 
Nick, I don't know how to say your name, but it says, I broke my left pinky when I was less than one years old and it feels so clunky. Even if you didn't break your, your left pinky, I think your pinky would feel clunky. That's where you want to get into doing some proper finger exercises to try and develop the strength. And not only the strength of that pinky, but the dexterity between your pinky and other fingers. So doing some finger exercises on a daily basis for the rest of your career of playing guitar would be really, really good for you. Okay. Um, playing live with a band, we have to do what is best sounding for the common good. Well, again, it depends. You know, I play in all kinds of different bands, but one of the bands I play in is incredibly heavy and we play stuff from Devin Townsend to prong to Slayer to whatever in that band. And do we play what's best sounding for the common good? I don't know. <laughs> we play what's best sounding for us. Right. But if you're trying to make money at it, you know, if you're trying to make a living at it, you know, that's, that's a little bit harder to do unless, you know, you're, um, someone of profile that people would want to come out and see, you know, that's the whole thing. So let's see here. Uh, this is a 24 top, uh, a custom 24 10 top, I should say. And, uh, it's called whale blue faded whale blue, but this was, this was a, a model from like a couple years ago, but they still have these custom 24s and things like that. Are there any famous solos? Axe Dean says, are there any famous solos you would have played differently? Oh, I'm sure. I mean, I, there's, but again, I, I, I couldn't say. I usually pick, you know, I, songs, I, I accept them as what they are. If I play them, I'll, you know, 90% of the time I change things about the song. If I'm playing it live or something, I'm not one of those players that tries to play everything note for note to try and replicate whatever. I, I just like to rock out with my friends and shred some things and stuff like that. So most of the time I wind up changing things about what I do. Okay. How do you make a melody stand out in your solo? This is from Facebook, but you didn't put your name on there. So I'm not sure who this is. How do you make a solo? How do you make a melody stand out in your solo? When I solo, I do sound melodic, but I can't really get a central melody. Well, again, that's a writing thing, right? I mean, if you think of songs that have melodies, right? Whatever it is. <laughs> Let's throw some distortion and that delay back on there. Right, you just have to create something that you like and then create stuff around that. But, you know, every time you go to solo, you're not going to be able to create an iconic uh, melody that, you know, is defining every time you play. And here's something else I want you all to understand. When you're jamming over jam tracks, backing tracks, wherever you get them from, okay, it might be three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes long, whatever they are. Understand that in the real world, most people don't just solo for seven minutes. You know, you might have a spot in a show where you solo for a while. You might have a little bit longer spot in a particular song or something like that. But even if you go out and see Eric Johnson play, his songs are structured. He's not just improvising for seven straight minutes, right? His songs are structured and there might be little, well, not even might, there is definitely little places in there where he's going to improvise around, but the song has a structure. The, the misconception that we have sometimes with, that I found with students is that when we just play along with jam tracks all the time, it always feels like we're just kind of doing the same thing over and over and nothing really has defining features like an actual song would. And of course it doesn't because it's just there to give you a template for five minutes or whatever it is for you to test out things. You know, if you really want to write a song, whether it's bluesy or not, you want to come up with a chord progression. You want to come up with a rhythm. You want to come up with a groove. You want to come up with a tempo, all of those things and build something and then try and write something real over the top. And again, that doesn't mean that it won't have improv elements in it. It might, it might not, I don't know, but don't misunderstand the, the, the point of a jam track. You, you could take your favorite guitar player and if you stick them on an A minor blues nine minute jam track, it's going to get old for after a while, no matter who it is that's sewing over it, no matter who your favorite guitar player, because that's a long time to sit and just play over the same thing, the same progression for nine minutes, right? But the point of the jam track is to give you an opportunity to learn to build ideas. Now, if you come up with a super cool idea, you might turn that jam track off and start creating your own song. So think about that a little bit when you're jamming along with stuff. 
Okay. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so I see we got a few people here that are talking about some accidents they've had with their their hands and things like that. I get it. Okay. Um, but that's the thing is, is we all have those struggles. You know, none of us are, are perfect, regardless of what some people believe. Uh, and we've all got our struggles. So we got to figure out how to get through those things and make this work, right? So we're going to get going here. It's one o'clock. And uh, so, but thank you. I mean, all, so many of you stuck around here for an entire hour and I thank you so much for your time. And please do me a favor, check out uh, Creative Blue Soloing, see if it's something you might be interested in. Most importantly, stay positive and keep practicing and find motivation, find a way to stay motivated. If you're in a rut where you're just playing the same things over and over and over and you're getting frustrated, you gotta find a way out of that. Whether it's learning a new song, whether it's jamming with some friends, whether it's trying to write something, even if it's ridiculously silly that nobody will ever hear, you gotta find a way to stay motivated because Without motivation, it kills everything else around it. We don't want that to happen. I want you to keep practicing. I want you to keep playing, right? So everybody take care, stay positive, and I will talk to you soon, okay?